Hello and welcome to Long Story Short, New Catalan Short Stories in English, part of the cultural programme of the Institut Ramon Yu at London Book Fair 2021. My name is Erica Hesketh, Chief Executive of the Poetry Translation Centre here in London, and it is my pleasure to be in conversation with two fantastic writers from Barcelona, Teresa Solana and Jordi Punti, who are both here in their capacity as short story writers, both with recent collections out in English translation. We'll be chatting a little bit about what makes the short story form so very magical, about literary identities, the book scene in Catalonia, and Catalan writers we should be looking out for now and in the years to come. This event looks ahead to London Book Fair 2022, when there will be a cultural spotlight on Catalan literature and an even bigger celebration of all things Catalan. Please feel free to ask your questions to our speakers in the Q&A box you'll see on your screen as we're talking, and we'll come to them live at the end of the discussion. All right, let me introduce Theresa and Jordi to you, and I'm going to also ask them to give us a micro reading from their books as well, so we can get to know them a bit on the page. Teresa Solana, hailing from Barcelona but now based in Oxford, is the author of several highly acclaimed novels, including A Not-So-Perfect Crime, the first in the Borja and Eduard crime series, which won the Brigada 21 prize for the best Catalan crime novel in 20, 2006. She's also written children's fiction and is a literary translator from French, Spanish and English. Her latest book, The First Prehistoric Serial Killer and Other Stories, was published in English in 2018 by Bitter Lemon Press in translation by Peter Bush. Hello, Teresa. Hello. Um, very nice to meet you. And um, please, can we have a little reading from the first prehistoric serial killer? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the beginning of the story titled The First Prehistoric Serial Killer. A number of us wake up this morning when the storm broke, only to find another corpse in the cave. This time, it was Athelstan. I almost fainted the second I saw his smashed skull and his brain seeping down his temples into a pool of black, black blood. But the others slapped me and I came around. And I, came around. I rushed to rouse our chief to ask him to come and take a look and tell us what to do. Ethelred is on the left side and sleeps like a dog. And though the men shouted, in the end we had to piss on him to get him to steer. Grumbling and very iron, our chief examined Athelstan's body, cursing our, our bones for dragging him out of bed at such an early hour. In the meantime, the rain stopped and the sun began to shine. While Ethelred and the others speculated about what had happened, I just studied the bloody rock that lay a few yards from Athelstan's, Athelstan's corpse and suggest to Ethelred that the two might be related. Ethelred, a rather laconic troglodyte, looked at me skeptically and warned me not to jump to conclusions. Thank you so much. Our other speaker today is Jordi Punti, who was born in and still lives in Barcelona. He's mainly a fiction writer, but has also been a translator and a regular contributor to the Spanish and Catalan press. He's published three books of short stories and the novel Lost Luggage, which won numerous prizes, including the Premi, the Premi Ibreter, the Catalan Booksellers Prize, and has been translated into more than 16 languages. His latest collection, This Is Not America, was published in English in 2019 by Atria Books, which is part of Simon & Schuster, and was translated by Julie Walk. Hello, Jordi. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And please may we have a little reading from This Is Not America. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm going to read from the beginning of a short story called Blinker. I'm the briefcase guy and I hitch rides. Everyone knows me. Well, when I say everyone, I mean all the folks who regularly take the road from Vic to San Kirza or from San Kirza to Vic and beyond. Hundreds of people who one day or another have glanced at me when they've driven past or looked at me with a sneer as if they're bothered by the fact that I'm there all alone or deliberately avoided eye contact. Sometimes I imagine them at home having dinner looking for something to talk about, 
today I saw that guy hitching outside Bic, the briefcase guy. Oh, that's creepy, she says with a pointless shiver that starts and stops right there. They say these things because I've got a clown's face, a clown without makeup. And everyone knows that clowns are scary, especially out of context and with no kids to amuse. I know because I look at the mirror at home and pull faces. I can see that I've got an agreeable, confident expression, but it only takes the movement of a couple of muscles to contract it into a grim mask. My reddened, slightly bulbous nose, rosacea, not booze, big mouth, thick arched eyebrows, round head and curly hair, all conspire to turn me into a diabolical goblin, or worse, a diabolical old man on the lookout for heaven knows what. So I try not to laugh much, that, and because I'm getting old. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. It's really, really lovely to be read to on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, now, you've both published in other forms, uh, novels, crime fiction, and I would like to know what for you is so special about the short story form um, as writers uh, or even as readers? Jordi, maybe we can come to you first. Uh, yeah, well, the thing is that to me, short story writing is it's a faster solution. I mean, I it, it takes a long, long time to have results from the writing of a novel. And when you write a short story, you, I mean, you, you have everything speeds up in the sense that it's faster to write, but it's also faster to get uh, results of people reading it and, you know, get, get some uh, feedback. And, uh, and this I like. And then also I realized that there are some things that are bet better told in short stories form than in, in the novel form. I, I, once I tried to, someone asked me, how would I make the difference? And I would say that, so, for example, Writing a short story is like uh, uh, bathing in a swimming pool, which is very, you know, limited and you know exact the limits and, and how far you can go. And, and writing a novel is writing, uh, it's, it's like bathing or, or uh, swimming on, on the beach, on, on the seaside, right? Because there, there are no limits and you don't know exactly what would find inside on, on the depth of the waters, no? And, and there's a, an element of surprise which is bigger in, in the novel than in the short story. That's a very interesting um, uh, metaphor for it. I, 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 and I, I love the idea that the short story is the sort of contained space, whereas the novel could be more like the sea. But, I'm, but I also noticed in Teresa, your collection, that um, you almost use the story as a way to speculate in really quite wild ways. There are all these amazing scenarios that maybe that maybe wouldn't fit in a novel? Or how does the short story form feel to you? This is your first collection, isn't it? Well, um, in, in fact, this is uh, two books that I publish in two collections of short stories that I already publish in, in Catalan. So both books are, are here. It's a kind of anthology. Uh, in my case, I used to write uh, short stories when I finish a novel, you know, between, between one novel and the next one is a kind of, of, to, of taking a break uh? and you are uh, you're absolutely right uh, in my in my short stories that are also uh, crime fiction stories with a you know a dark sense of humor uh, I, I can be much more bizarre one uh, so yeah, yeah, um, it's completely different, you know, to write a novel and to write a short story. And as Jordi said, the novel allows you to to really focus on on a subject and 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 to be more 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 free, if you want. Mm -hmm. The short story is a palate cleanser. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so, tell me a little bit about uh, your identity as writers, how you see yourself. I know you've both um, travelled a bit with your work and met writers from different places and been part of um, a kind of a bigger scene, if you like, but how important is your Catalan identity to you, you know, on or off the page and how far do you feel European as writers or, or, or global as writers? Um, maybe, Teresa, over to you first. Well, you know, Catalan is my mother tongue. 
Um, but when I was young, I had to to study to, to make my studies at the school in in Spanish because uh, it was not possible to study Catalan at the school. So uh, Spanish was the the, my, the language I, I I learned first to write to read, but of course at home uh, with my family with my friends we speak Catalan and when. Uh, when I was, I don't know, maybe in, in my twenties, uh, I decided that I wanted to to know much more about the Catalan Britain culture, uh, literature. So, I, I mean, now honestly, I feel Catalan, no, because the, I think the mother tongue is very, very important, and the kind of stories that I write, I write them in Catalan because I think in them in Catalan. So, hmm. hey, thank you. And how about you, Jordi? Well, uh, I do. I, I think I'm I'm quite similar to to Teresa in the sense that I my identity for for the Catalan it's it, it's totally related to the language to the to the uh, idiom that I used to write. I think I couldn't write fiction in Spanish, although I speak perfectly, of course, Spanish. I'm bilingual, but I couldn't do fiction in Spanish because my mother tongue is also Catalan and, and actually I never thought about writing fiction in Spanish. But to me, this is a, a two dimensional or if you want to say it better, like a, a two way uh, relationship in the sense that I feel very local when I write about Catalans, but I'd also at the same time very universal. So, for example, the story that I, I was starting to read, it's a story which happens to it takes place in a very small part of my hometown, very, very local. Uh, but at the same time, I, it was written in New York. When I was living there, it was commissioned to me. And 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 writing New York, the easiest way would have been to, you know, to write about, I don't know, uh, Central Park or about Fifth Avenue. But actually, what came to my mind, it was go back and, and write about your roots and about but your beginnings, let's say. No? So there's always this, this relationship in the sense that I feel very local to the language and to the Catalan tradition. But at the same time, because of that, I feel I'm part of a, if you want to say like that, like a, a global, more European tradition, which is also a sort of tradition made from the, you know, the in the narrative, the, 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 the writers that like to narrate in long, in length, that, that they like that the that they like the idea of writing about something that comes to your mind not not like ideas but also but but more, mainly more importantly things happen things that happen to you like an instinct there's an instinct of narrating that you have to fulfill through writing right and and i think this this is a tradition that it's not only catalan of course it's it's um, it comes from everywhere and, and from that i feel part of this tradition i'd say yeah, writing from lived experience, I guess, and also there's something quite international, internationalist or internationally minded about writing about your roots, because there's something about, you know, no longer being in the place where you were born, and that is something that is something of our time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit, I've never been to um, Barcelona, and um, I imagine everybody there is bilingual, but what do people read in in Catalonia? What do people read a lot of Catalan writers? Is it what are people's tastes like? What's what's the sort of scene? Um... <laughs> yeah, do you want me to answer that? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're there. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it's, that's not easy. I mean, we, we are really bilingual, so we can read both languages and uh, and I'd say, of course, Catalan writers, people read them in Catalan and then Spanish and South American writers, so normally you would read them in Spanish, right? Um, this is more complicated than when it comes to translations, because normally most publishers uh, would fight for the Catalan or the Spanish translation, and and there's a certain you you know there's a certain tradition of relying more on the Spanish translation. Although I think that in the last twenty or thirty years, the the importance of the Catalan translations has become more and more uh, vivid and more more clear. So nowadays, I would say, I, don't, I have no no that data about that, but I would say that probably it's 50-50, right? That, that people can read uh, in Catalan or in Spanish in, in Catalonia, in both languages, it would be half and half. 
but I'm not completely sure about that. In any case, what I think it's important is to realize that the, the Catalan publishing world is a very normal and very functional commercial Catalan. It's not something folkloristic or that, you know, a small thing that some druids meet to, to make uh, work. It's, it's more like a, a real, real uh, you know, a commerce, commercial thing. It works very well. I yeah. don't know if you feel the same, uh, Teresa. Do you think it's, I'm, I'm accurate with that? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. No, I think the main difference between, for example, in the UK and... Oh. No, I, I was saying that the, 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 main, the main difference between the, the UK and Catalonia, for instance, is that you go to a bookshop and you can find a, a, a large variety of languages, mainly English, translations from English, of course, but you can find a, a large number of, of, of languages there. And a novelist and book and some perspectives. Uh, in the UK, you go to a bookshop and you have to go specifically to the place of uh, translated books that uh, oh, used to be yeah. very, very small. So I think the Catalan readers are much more used to read authors from from a variety of countries yeah, and languages. That's, that's, that's right. different. Yep, it's um, we're still on that road here. <laughs> In the, in the anglophone world um so that actually brings us on i hope that you can recommend me or recommend our, our viewers um some catalan writers who who must be translated into english um who uh, we should go and uh, speak to uk and us publishers about to to encourage them to nab the rights have you got anyone um that you can recommend to us maybe um teresa first well I don't know because I think that there are uh, classics, uh, Catalan classics that has already been translated many years ago that they clearly need uh, retranslation. And I also think that there are young um, writers that uh, for them, for us, is, is very difficult to 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 find a to find a publisher, for instance, in the in the English world. So. I don't know exactly what name to recommend you because I don't want to say one specifically, specifically but, but I think that uh, there are a lot that they deserve to be to be written in English, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'll give some names because I, I think it's important too. And uh, well, well the, good, the good thing is that the short story um, uh, situation in Catalan now is is blossoming with a, a lot of new authors and uh, and I would say for example Irene Pujadas is a very good short story writer Damià Bardera um, Jordi Nopka or Anna Gas to name a few and um, and actually I know for a fact that in in the in the next months I don't know exactly when but in the next months Coma Press is publishing a, a collection of uh, short story writers from Barcelona um, that write about Barcelona and um, I'm luckily a part of them and, and I know there will be some new names there to discover and to find out, um, you know, these young writers uh, in Catalan. That's great. Is that in the Book of series? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you. I, I agree, Jordi. I think it, um, it is really it is really great to 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 name writers that you admire and that you like to read because that's how we find out about them. And um, I um, I look forward to hearing more about about these writers and other writers um, in the years to come, especially following on from um, next year's London Book Fair Cultural Spotlight. Um, we're already out of time amazingly but i want to thank both of you <laughs> um, for for meeting together to talk about short stories to talk about your work and um we've just got uh, about five minutes to take some questions from the audience so we're about to go to the live q a thank you very much excellent thank you very much thank you, thank you very much
Um, so first question for you both, just following on really from what you were just talking about, Geordie, there, what do you think has been behind this sort of blossoming of short story writing in Catalan? Has there been particular government support or opportunities for writers or just people's reading taste? Uh, huh. Well, yeah, uh, first thing I think, that I think it's important to, to acknowledge that there's already a long, very important tradition of short story in Catalan, which you know, it's bigger than it would be, for example, in Spanish. Uh, I, I would I would say that lots of uh, writers, when they start, the first thing they try is the short story. So because they have lots of channels, they can, you know, they can apply to different prizes and, and contests. So normally this would be the, the starting point, right? You write a, a short story uh, or a, even a collection and then and then you try to try to go somewhere but the new thing the other thing is that th that makes for this blossoming is that uh in the last 10 days 10 years sorry there has been a, a lot of new independent publishers in catalan people who are more uh keen to risk in a new author and and risk also in a short story collection which normally wouldn't sell as well as a novel so these two things the fact that there's already a, a new you know, a new group of writers and a new group of publishers who are, you know, ready to publish uh, new authors. That that makes, I think, for this good moment. That that makes sense, and it resonates a bit with different movements of independent publishers who are making um, making things shift in different countries. So it's kind of cheering to hear that that's happening there too. Teresa, do you have um, something else to add on this? Yeah, well, I think that Jordi has uh, perfectly explained uh, what is happening uh, with this blossom of short stories in, in Catalonia. But I also want to, to say that I am not quite sure that the readers uh, love so much short stories. Because well, I always, when I talk to publishers, they complain that uh, readers at, at, are not very, very... Uh, that, that, so they, they, they prefer to, to, to buy novels to short stories. So it's always a, a problem to try to, to publish a book of short stories. For instance, in crime fiction, that is my speciality, there are uh, not books of uh, short stories. It's just now that we are starting to publish uh, short stories from Catalan uh, crime fiction writers. Yeah. If, I, if I may add something, sorry, it's just I, I agree with with Teresa. The thing is that it, there's not a there's not a big tradition of of short story writing of crime stories, and and I was I was saying that the thing is that the new publishers are the ones who are more ready to you know to risk uh, or to start with with a new author that writes short stories. Then of course there's the the market uh, asks for more novels, but but I think it's good that there's a uh, this balance of you know, some uh, commercial novels, but also some new writers who try its way uh, through the short story. Yeah, but this is related to the prejudice from the point of view of the reader that to write a novel is much more difficult than to write a short story. Yeah. So sometimes they think you know, that, oh, well, you write short stories, well, you are good, but not so good, no? <laughs> not for, for the big names, you know, like, like Kim Munzo or Sergi Pamias, but uh, for other writers, it's much more difficult to, to sell short I stories. See. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, it's, uh, having worked in publishing in English as well, uh, there's often this perception that um, whether it's correct or not, that readers prefer long form. But I was what I really loved actually about reading your collection, Teresa, was the the innovation of putting crime, um, the kind of crime tropes and crime crime aesthetics into short story writing. I thought that was really innovative and exciting. So I hope more people get to read your your book. Um, we've got time for just a tiny little question. You, you've both um, worked professionally as translators. How involved were you in the bringing over of your work into English? Were you working very closely with Peter and Julie or how, how did you approach it? Um, well, well in, in, in my case it's easy because I am married with my English translator. 
So, <laughs> yeah, and we can work very, very closely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I do work quite closely too with Julie Ward by pure luck because she's a, a good friend and she's a neighbor. Actually, the first time she translated something uh, from me, which was a novel, uh, she sent me an email and said, well, when, when could we meet for, you know, for an exchange before starting? And, and so we, we exchanged uh, our details and, and it happened that we are living, you know, like 500 meters away one from each other. So. Yeah, and, and we probably had seen each other at the supermarket on the corner, but we didn't know each other. So, but now we do, and uh, and so whenever she translates something I have done, we 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 look it very close in, and she's also very very open to accept, you know, my ideas or some changes that I may may try to do because th there's always this thing that when you, when you work in another language, even you don't even if you don't know that language that well. Um, and it's just a third hand language. Uh, the fact that you can see yourself in those other words, um, you know, there's something that you need to add something. You don't, you just don't look at it. You do, if you're, you know, if you know a little bit of English, and, and I'm sure for Teresa is the same, there's a moment when you will be there and say, okay, what if we say this word instead of this other one? I, I guess it's a word, it's a way of, you know, li leaving your print even in, a, in another language. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I think that's a very um, beautiful uh, image for us to finish on. And I also, I didn't know how uh, physically close you both were to your translation, yeah. which is a lovely thing to think about. Um, thank you very much for, um, for, for giving us your insights and um, for being at the fair. And thank you to um, those of you who've been watching as well. Um, this event will continue to be available uh, to to view on the London Book Fair platform after after the event finishes. Uh, enjoy the rest of the fair, and thank you very much for being here, Jordi, Teresa, and all of you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye.